I'm an astronaut selected for a lunar mission aimed at studying geological formations on the moon. The mission also serves as a precursor for future colonization projects. We are the second crew to operate out of this base. The first team left months ago, and their data made our mission seem pretty straightforward. Land, collect samples, carry out experiments, and return. But that's not how it goes down for me. I remember landing with an overwhelming sense of awe, staring out of the spacecraft window at the barren, gray landscape. The sense of isolation is immediate but thrilling. We land near the established moon base, which has all the essentials. Living quarters, a control room, and storage for scientific equipment. My fellow astronauts and I make our way into the base, excited to start the mission proper. The first few days go by without a hitch. We carry out experiments, collect samples, and send updates back to mission control on Earth. Everything is going as planned. But on the fifth day, that's when the trouble starts. Our return spacecraft, sitting a few hundred meters from the base, suffers a systems failure during a routine check. Immediately, we're in crisis mode. We run diagnostics and quickly find out that the spacecraft isn't going anywhere without significant repairs, repairs that require parts we don't have. The team holds a meeting, and after a lot of discussions and consultations with Earth, it's decided. The mission is to be aborted. Another spacecraft is to be sent to bring us home, but it's going to take time to prepare and launch the rescue mission. And here's the kicker. There's only enough fuel in the backup escape pod for one person to return to Earth immediately. As the mission's commander, my team insists that I should be the one to go back. After a tense conversation, we all agree it's the best course of action. I'll return to Earth, report the situation, and help expedite the rescue mission for the others. I say my goodbyes, board the escape pod, and make the journey back home. Or at least, that's what was supposed to happen. Something goes wrong during the descent. Systems fail, alarms blare, and I'm knocked unconscious. When I come to, I find myself back at the moon base. The escape pod is damaged beyond repair, making it a one-way trip back to where I started. So now, I'm stranded. The base is still functional but running on limited backup power. I can survive here for a while, but not indefinitely. Communication with Earth is down, and I'm isolated in the most profound sense of the word. I focus on trying to repair the communication systems, hoping to re-establish contact with Earth. My fellow astronauts have likely already left the moon, assuming the rescue mission was successful. I'm alone in this moon base a sprawling complex designed to house a team of astronauts. Its hallways are long and empty, its rooms filled with unused equipment and supplies. The silence is almost complete, broken only by the hum of generators and air filtration units. With no contact with Earth, my routine is basic. Ration my food, monitor the base's systems, and try to repair the communication equipment to call for help. But a few days into this routine, the solitude starts to feel less complete. I hear noises, soft ones that are barely discernible at first. They echo down the moon base's empty hallways. The logical part of me tries to dismiss it. These sounds could be the result of any number of things. The base, though seemingly dormant, is still a complex piece of engineering. It has moving parts, hydraulic systems, and electrical circuits. It's not unthinkable that some of these might make noise. However, the sounds grow more frequent. They seem to move, originating from different parts of the base at different times. It becomes harder to shake the notion that this isn't just random noise. They don't sound like squeaking machinery or the wind against the outer hull. They have a pattern, a cadence that seems almost deliberate. In the back of my mind, a gnawing feeling of unease starts to grow. I'm trained to deal with isolation and stress, but this is different. With each passing day, the noises seem to grow louder, more frequent, and increasingly varied. Sometimes they mimic the clang of metal, other times they sound almost organic, like the distant murmur of voices. But voices can't be, there's no one else here. At least there shouldn't be. I've walked through the base multiple times, flashlight in hand, 
trying to trace the origins of these sounds. All I find are empty rooms and silent machinery. There's no sign of movement, no evidence of malfunctioning equipment that could explain what I'm hearing. Yet, the sounds persist. The base's security systems are rudimentary and designed to alert us to mechanical failures or changes in atmospheric conditions. They're not equipped to detect intruders. Still, I modify what I can, setting up motion sensors in strategic hallways and storage rooms. I adjust the base's internal cameras to cover more angles, all in the hopes of catching whatever is responsible for these noises. As I sit in the control room, reviewing sensor data and camera feeds, I hear it again. A soft, almost inquisitive sound, like something tapping on metal. It comes from a corridor leading to the living quarters. I stand up, my heart pounding. This is no random noise. Something is here with me. Weeks have passed, and the noises that once seemed rare are now a constant in my daily life. Not only are they more frequent, but they're also more varied. Clanging, scratching, and sometimes even whisper-like sounds that I can't quite make out. It becomes clear to me that these aren't accidental or mechanical noises. There's an intent behind them. To get to the bottom of this, I know I have to dig deeper. So, I take some precautions. I locate the sturdiest flashlight we have in the storage room, check its batteries, and make sure it's in working order. For protection, my options are limited. Guns or any sort of lethal weapons are against protocol on space missions, but I find a heavy wrench, solid, with a good grip. I pocket a utility knife as well, just in case. The base is eerily quiet as I venture out of the control room, my flashlight piercing through the darkness. With each step, I feel a growing sense of dread, but also determination. Something is going on, and I need to find out what. The hallways are long and stretch into darkened alcoves and closed-off rooms. Most are just storage or equipment rooms, but as I walk, I notice something alarming. There are marks on the walls. These aren't just scuffs or wear and tear, they look like deliberate scratches etched into the walls. As I examine them closely, it becomes evident that they resemble claw marks more than anything else. The logical part of me wants to dismiss it. There can't be any life forms here, but the evidence is mounting. I follow the marks, feeling a mix of apprehension and curiosity. They guide me to sections of the base I've had no reason to visit before. These are older parts, likely used by the previous mission crew for experiments that are now long abandoned. Some rooms have machinery covered with tarps, and others have workstations with faded documents. My flashlight flickers as I scan the room, and I tighten my grip on the wrench. And then I see it. More claw marks, this time carved deeply into a wooden crate. I approach, cautiously extending my hand to touch the marks. They're deep, and look fresh, further intensifying the confusing set of emotions I'm feeling. Whatever made these marks is strong. But what could it be? I've read all the mission reports and seen all the data. According to every known scientific observation, the moon is devoid of life. My mind races as I ponder the implications. Have I overlooked something? For all the training and preparation, nothing has prepared me for this. Diagnostics, run security protocol, I command, my voice cutting through the silence as I speak into the wrist interface. Security protocol initiated. Warning, unidentified movements detected in Sector 7, replies the computerized voice, with a tone that would be dispassionate if a machine could feel. Great, I mutter under my breath, my heart rate picking up a bit. Just what I needed. Knowing that basic protocols are not going to be enough, I decide it's time to amp up the base's security measures. I make my way back to the control room, where a bank of monitors displays feed from the internal cameras. Next to them is a cabinet filled with electrical and mechanical components. I dig through the cabinet and find a variety of materials. Wires of different gauges, motion sensors that were designed for scientific experiments, and even some small alarms that were meant to alert us in case of equipment malfunction. It's not a lot, but it's something. 
I start considering the best way to set up a makeshift security system. In the end, I opt for a basic perimeter defense around the most critical areas of the moon base, the control room, the living quarters, and the emergency exit. I spend hours connecting wires, calibrating sensors, and positioning alarms. The work is meticulous and exhausting, but I can't afford any mistakes. Finally, after triple-checking all the connections, I activate the system. Once the security measures are active, I lower myself into the control room chair and take a deep breath. It feels like I've been holding it for weeks. The quiet that envelops the room is tangible, almost as if the base itself is holding its breath with me. But it doesn't last long. That noise drifts through the air from down the hall. I stiffen in my seat, eyes darting to the bank of monitors displaying the camera feeds. I rise from the chair. Wrench in hand, I walk cautiously down the corridor toward where I think the sound originated. My steps are measured, my ears straining to catch any hint of movement. As I get closer to what I assume is the source, the noise abruptly ceases. The sudden silence is unsettling. Is anyone there? I call out, my voice reverberating off the metallic walls. The question hangs in the air, unanswered, leaving me with an increasing sense of unease. All that greets me is the drone and the occasional beep from the base's machinery. With a heavy heart and a mind swirling with questions, I return to the control room. It's evident now that whatever is making those noises is aware of my presence. I settle back into my chair, my gaze darting between the monitors and the control panel, where the indicators for my makeshift security system glow a reassuring green. Yet the assurance feels hollow. As I sit there, my mind can't help but churn with questions. What is this entity? Why is it here, in a place humans believe to be barren of life? Does it consider me an intruder? Does it have wants or intentions that I can even comprehend? It's been a few days now and the darkness outside the base feels almost oppressive, except for the distant glow of Earth. I'm in that space where my mind hovers between dreams and the conscious world. Then suddenly, a high-pitched wail reverberates through the air while my wrist interface jolts me with a series of strong vibrations. Security breach detected in Sector 3, says the robotic voice coming from the interface strapped to my wrist. As adrenaline courses through my body, the mental haze that accompanies near sleep disappears instantly. Jumping out of my makeshift bed, I grab the wrench from the table and a flashlight from the nearby shelf. Once I reach my control room, my eyes dart to the bank of monitors mounted above the main control panel. These screens are connected to various security cameras positioned throughout the base. On one of them, I see movement, but the camera's poor resolution and monochrome display make it hard to identify what exactly it is. My fingers hover over the keyboard as I switch between camera views, attempting to get a better angle on it. Then, I hear the second alert. Security breach detected in Sector 2, the computer announces, signaling the entity's advance toward my location. I don't waste any time. I reach into a nearby storage locker and take out a box of flares. Leaving the control room behind, I step into the corridor, clutching the box of flares in one hand and the flashlight in the other. I move slowly, trying to minimize the noise I make, but every creak of the metal floor beneath me seems amplified in the quiet. As I navigate the hallway, I hear it, a noise that isn't just the base settling or machinery operating on backup power. It's a shuffling sound, a soft movement that stands out against the ambient noises of the base. I quickly lift the flashlight and shine its beam ahead of me. For a fleeting instant, the light catches something. What I see is not human. It's almost solid yet somewhat ethereal. The form is twisted, like a contorted silhouette made of a dark, inky substance. It's roughly the height of a person, but its limbs appear disproportionate and are bent at odd angles. What draw my attention most are its eyes, if they can be called that. They are two points that glow with an eerie, luminescent light, like orbs of phosphorescent material. These eyes catch the flashlight's beam and reflect it back at me. 
It's as if they are capturing the light, yet remain impenetrable, giving no indication of emotion or intent. Fear is surging through me, but it's matched by a spike in adrenaline that pushes me into action. Without hesitating, I strike the flare on the rough surface of a wall. It ignites immediately, casting a harsh red light that dances wildly across the walls of the corridor. With my other hand, I lift the wrench and slam it hard against a metal railing nearby. The sound reverberates, creating a loud clang that echoes through the hollow expanse of the moon base. For a second that feels like an eternity, there's no response. Then, it comes, a high-pitched screech that is so piercing, it's as if the noise is originating within my own skull. The entity doesn't like the light or the noise. It quickly retreats, its form quickly swallowed by the further reaches of the base's maze-like interior. I head back to the control room, my nerves frayed but intact. As I walk in, my eyes fall on a bookshelf that I hadn't really paid attention to before. Among the various pieces of technical literature and equipment manuals, there's something else, a set of mission logs bound in faded leather. The corners are worn, and the pages are yellowed, they're clearly from previous expeditions. My curiosity gets the better of me. It's a desperate shot at understanding what is happening here. I reach for one of the logs and pull it down, opening it to the first page, hungry for answers that might help me understand what I'm up against. Log Entry 1, Date, July 2nd, 1975 Astronaut, Commander Sarah Williams We noticed an anomaly today. Sensors picked up movement in Sector 7, where no one has been assigned work. Initially, we dismissed it as a sensor glitch. However, subsequent scans have shown continued, albeit sporadic, movement. I led a team to investigate, and we found markings on the walls, similar to claw marks but inconsistent with any equipment or tools we have. No immediate explanation is available. The situation escalated when Lieutenant Miller reported hearing strange sounds in the corridor near the living quarters. Other team members confirm hearing similar noises. A thorough search yielded no source for these sounds. All machinery is working as expected, and no anomalies were found in the structural integrity of the base. We decided to increase security protocols and closely monitor the affected sectors. As the commanding officer, I'm concerned about the crew's rising tension and sense of unease. Psychological factors in a confined environment like this are not to be taken lightly. But I must admit, something feels off here, beyond mere human factors. Log Entry 2 Date, August 17, 1981 Astronaut, Lieutenant Michael Chen Today's incident has left us rattled. During a routine maintenance walk in Sector 4, one of our crew members, Ensign Johnson, went missing. Search parties were dispatched immediately. He was found three hours later, disoriented and unable to account for the lost time. His suit's life support systems were in disarray. The strange thing is that Johnson is one of our most experienced crew members. Adding to the mystery, our external cameras captured a shadowy figure near the airlock around the time Johnson went missing. Attempts to enhance the image have been largely unsuccessful. It's indistinct, shape-shifting almost, as if it's not entirely solid. It doesn't match any of the suits we have, nor does it align with any equipment on the base. New security measures are being put in place, and we're restricting movement to essential tasks only. The base is on high alert. It's not just a matter of mechanical failure or human error anymore. Something else is at play here, something we don't understand. Log Entry 3, Date, October 23rd, 1986 Astronaut, Dr. Emily Patel We attempted communication today. Dr. Lewis and I set up an array of devices designed to emit various frequencies, hoping to initiate some form of dialogue with the entity. The results were disheartening. Not only did the entity not respond, but we also experienced a full system blackout for approximately 47 seconds. When power returned, our data logs were wiped clean. For the first time since these encounters began, we captured an audio response. 
It's a haunting sound, a high-pitched screech that doesn't correlate with any known form of communication. Analysis of the audio doesn't offer any clues. It's like nothing we've encountered in terrestrial or extraterrestrial communications. We're faced with an ethical dilemma. Continue our attempts to communicate and risk further incidents, or focus solely on fortification and defense. For now, we're choosing the latter. The risks of engagement seem to outweigh the potential benefits. We're no closer to understanding what this entity is or what it wants, but one thing is clear. It's not interested in talking. I set the logs back on the shelf, sliding them into their place among the documents and manuals. As I do, a newfound determination forms within me. My situation is now part of a larger, darker narrative, one filled with hidden risks and untold stories. I sit down in the worn chair in front of the control panel. My thoughts are racing, but they're focused and sharper now. I know the entity is aware of me. It's been showing signs of increasing boldness as it lurks within the confined spaces of this base. The entity knows I'm here, and I know it's here. It's hunting me, stalking me through the corridors and rooms of this dying base. But now, I also know that I'm not its first prey. The question is, will I be its last? No, don't think like that. Focus on the here and now. I need to survive. I need to find a way off this moon and back to Earth. But I also need to leave a warning, a message for anyone who might follow me here. The entity is real. The danger is real. I glance at the monitors, then at my wrist interface. The green lights of the security system blink back at me. They seem almost mocking now these feeble attempts at security. I look away, my thoughts already moving to what I have to do next. The entity is still out there, lurking in the shadows, and it's only a matter of time before it comes back. But now, at least, I know what I'm up against. I begin contemplating my next move. I realize that I have to get to the comms room. It's my only chance to escape this nightmare. I glance at the screen that displays the layout of the base, taking a mental note of the shortest route to the comms room. If the entity is as intelligent as it seems, it'll anticipate my movements. I'll have to be quick and cautious. My hand hovers over the control panel, and then I disable the alarms along that path. If the entity is tracking the sound or movement of the alarms, this might throw it off. My eyes move to the storage cabinet where I keep the flares and noise-making devices. A quick distraction might buy me the time I need to reach the comms room and lock myself in. I gather a handful of flares, stuff them into my bag along with some simple tools for last-minute repairs, and prepare to make my move. Taking a deep breath to calm my racing heart, I step out of the control room. Every creak of the floor, every flicker of the lights makes me tense up. But I push forward. I know what I need to do, and so, gripping my bag tightly and bracing myself for whatever comes, I head toward the comms room. It's time to contact Earth. As I navigate the hallways, my senses are heightened. The entity is close. I can feel its presence like an electric charge in the air. Skittering sounds reverberate around me, each one more urgent than the last. The entity isn't just lurking now. It's pursuing me spurred into action by my desperate dash to the comms room. My heart pounds, but I force myself to focus on the goal. I need to reach that room. Finally, I arrive. My hands are trembling as I lock the heavy metal door behind me. I take a quick survey of the comms room. The communication module in front of me is a chaotic mess. Wires hang loose, some are frayed at the ends, and circuit boards show signs of damage. Okay. Let's do this, I whisper to myself, needing the sound of my own voice to break the mounting tension. I sit down and immediately get to work. The soldering iron is hot and ready, and I begin connecting wires with a focused intensity. My hands move almost automatically from years of training, stripping insulation, twisting copper strands, and applying solder where needed. I can't afford any mistakes. Every second I spend here is a second the entity has to reach me. I can't let my nerves sabotage this. It's too important. Finally, after what feels like forever, 
I hear a soft beep from the module. A green light flickers on, signaling a successful repair. I've done it. The relief that washes over me is short-lived, though. I still have to survive long enough for a rescue mission to reach me. Without wasting a second, I press the transmit button. Moonbase Alpha to Earth Control, do you read me? This is urgent! A burst of static fills the room, followed by an audible crackle. My heart is in my throat as I wait. Earth Control to Moonbase Alpha, we read you. What's your situation? Relief washes over me, so intense that my knees almost buckle. I need immediate evacuation. The base is compromised and I'm not alone here. Please send help, I reply as I try to hide my shaking voice. Understood. The soonest we can get to you is in three days. Can you hold out until then? The voice from Earth Control is calm, but I can sense the urgency behind the words. I glance nervously at the door of the comms room, as if expecting it to burst open at any moment. I'll try, I manage to say, swallowing hard. Stay strong. Earth Control out. The line goes dead, leaving me alone with the gravity of my situation. Three days. Seventy-two hours. That's how long I need to keep breathing, keep evading the entity in this base. I know the game has changed, it's aware that I might escape, and I have no illusions about what it will do to stop me. As I leave the comms room, my next destination is the control room, but I take detours along the way to reinforce my defenses. I've gathered a variety of materials, empty cans tied to strings, flares, and a couple of noise-making devices scavenged from the storage rooms. I strategically place these traps in hallways and junctions, aiming to create an early warning system as well as deter the entity. I've also connected a makeshift alarm to my wrist interface, a direct link to all the traps. It will vibrate the moment something triggers them. Once inside the control room, I spend extra time bolstering the door. Using a combination of heavy objects and some tools, I manage to create a barricade. It's not impenetrable, but it will slow the entity down and give me a few precious moments if it tries to breach the room. I test the alarm linkage with my wrist interface. It works. If anything comes close, I'll know immediately. Despite these precautions, I sense that the entity is learning and adapting. Later that night, the notion is confirmed when my wrist interface vibrates so violently it almost startles me out of my chair. The screen flashes red text. Security breach in Sector 4. I immediately turn my attention to the bank of monitors. My eyes dart from screen to screen, searching for any sign of movement. Then I see it, but only for an instant. A figure, twisted and blurry, darts across the field of one camera before disappearing from view. It's closer than ever. Suddenly, the room plunges into darkness and it takes a moment for my eyes to adjust. My heart sinks. The entity has somehow managed to cut off the power. In an instant, the monitors are black screens, the alarms are silent, and the electrically triggered traps I set throughout the base are now inactive. With a shaky hand, I strike a flare. The room gets bathed in a reddish light. Almost immediately, a noise grabs my attention. It comes from my left, a low grating sound that resonates through the room. My senses go into overdrive, it's in here with me. I quickly grab another flare from my pocket and toss it toward the source of the noise. The flare arcs through the air before landing, illuminating that corner of the room in its fiery glow. A shrill screeching noise erupts almost as if the entity is angered or maybe frustrated by the light. It's a sound that sends shivers down my spine, a mixture of fury and what seems like disappointment. Whatever it is, the sound fades, receding into the distance as if the entity is retreating further into the corridors of the base. With the entity momentarily deterred by the flare, I make a snap decision. I have to restore the power. I pick up another box of flares and a wrench, then head out of the control room. My steps are quick but deliberate. Every second without electricity is a win for the entity. 
It's a gamble to leave the relative safety of the room, but I have no choice. The base's electrical systems are centralized in a room that's two corridors away, and I need to get there fast. The air feels dense as I traverse the dim hallways, the light from the flares throwing long, eerie shadows against the walls. My wrist interface is offline due to the power outage, leaving me without my usual alerts. I rely solely on my senses, acutely aware of every sound that isn't my own breathing or footsteps. Every creak and distant rumble makes me tense, but I push forward. Finally, I reach the electrical room. I use another flare to light the space and quickly assess the situation. The room is filled with rows of electrical panels, most of which are open with their wiring exposed. It's clear that the entity has tampered with them. Wires are ripped out, circuit boards are damaged. I get to work immediately, using the wrench to open up one of the main panels that seem less damaged than the others. With the flare planted securely on a nearby table, casting its red light over my workspace, I begin repairing the most critical circuits. My hands move with practiced ease, reconnecting wires and replacing damaged fuses. The entity could reappear at any moment, and the weight of that possibility makes my hands shake, but I manage to steady them long enough to complete each connection. After what feels like an eternity but is probably closer to ten minutes, I've done all I can. I hold my breath and push the master switch. A hum fills the room, and the overhead lights flicker on. Relief washes over me. Power is restored, at least for now. I quickly exit the electrical room and head back to the control room, my steps lighter but still wary. The entity has already shown it can adapt. With power back on, I have the advantage of my electronic traps and surveillance. But that doesn't mean I can let my guard down. The next three days are an exhausting cycle of high alert and brief, uneasy rest. My meals consist of rationed food bars, and sleep comes only in restless, fitful naps. The wrist interface constantly updates me with new security alerts, each one spiking my adrenaline. Despite all my traps and alarms, the entity proves elusive. It triggers sensors and sets off flares, but avoids capture or injury. It's as if it's learning and adapting to my defenses, keeping just out of reach while staying close enough to remind me it's there. At last, the day I've been counting down to is here. My wrist interface displays the message I've been desperate to see. Rescue shuttle approaching. A wash of relief floods over me. I'm almost out of this nightmare. I start gathering my few belongings, notes, data drives, and other evidence that will corroborate my unbelievable story. But just as I'm zipping up my bag, an alert stops me in my tracks. Security breach in Sector 1. Sector 1 is adjacent to the control room. The entity is closer than it's ever been. This is its final gambit, a last-ditch attempt to prevent my escape. My traps are all set, and my makeshift alarm system is active, but at this moment, they provide little comfort. The entity is here, and it's just a wall away from me. My wrist interface is linked to the cameras outside the control room. I toggle through the feeds, trying to get a visual on the entity. There it is. A shapeless form moving past a camera, heading toward the room where I'm holed up. The rescue shuttle is close, but the entity is closer. I clutch the wrench, ready to use it if the entity breaches the room. Suddenly, a grating noise comes from the direction of the door. Metal is scraping against metal, signaling the entity's attempt to break in. My grip tightens on the wrench. I position myself for a confrontation that feels inevitable. My eyes are fixed on the door, my ears straining for any change in the sound that would indicate it's about to breach the room. Suddenly, the tension is cut by a new sound, the familiar hiss and clank of the airlock. My wrist interface vibrates with a new message. Rescue shuttle docked. They're here. The rescue team has made it. John, are you in here? A muffled voice shouts through the door. The words are like music to my ears. Not wasting a second, I rush over and quickly unlock the heavy door. I'm here. Get me out of this place. 
I exclaim, almost tripping over my own feet in my haste to exit. My eyes meet the concerned gaze of the rescue team, and I've never been happier to see other humans. We move quickly toward the shuttle. As I make my way down the hallway, my eyes dart for a split second to the hidden corners and shadowy recesses of the moon base. Is the entity there, watching me leave? Questions enter my mind, but they're overshadowed by the overwhelming thought that I'm finally leaving this place. I step onto the shuttle, the door closes behind me, and for the first time in what feels like an eternity, I feel safe. It's time to go home, and whatever questions remain about the entity are for another day. As we lift off, the moon growing smaller below us, I think about what I've left behind. A base filled with secrets, a lurking presence that defies understanding. But at least now, Earth will know what's out there. And maybe, just maybe, no one else will have to go through what I did.